The final episode of House of the Dragon Season 1 is about Rhaenyra and her family after the death of her father, King Viserys. In the previous episode, Alicent and the Greens crowned Aegon as the new king in King's Landing, while Rhaenyra is on the island of Dragonstone, and she doesn't yet know that the Greens stole her throne. So what happens and what does it mean? This video has no spoilers for Hot D past episode 10. The episode starts with Rhaenyra's son, Luke. Luke is worried, because if Lord Corlys dies of his fever, Luke will inherit Driftmark. He'll become the new leader of House Valerion, the Lord of the Tides. And Luke isn't ready for that. The Valerions are a sea power with ships, and Luke gets seasick. And Luke knows that he's not really a Valerion. He's actually the bastard son of Harwin Strong so his claim to Driftmark is illegitimate. Luke says he doesn't want Driftmark. He told Corlys the same thing years ago. But Rhaenyra says that Luke will do his duty, and she'll help him earn his inheritance. Because when Rhaenyra became heir to the throne, she felt the same fears and doubts that Luke feels now. It took years of learning and growing before Rhaenyra accepted her responsibilities. So will her children rise to the challenge like she did? Rhaenyra says it's their destiny to rule, as though their family was always meant to have the throne and Driftmark. But this season is all about the choices that created this political situation. Viserys chose to make Rhaenyra his heir, and chose to marry Alicent and father Aegon. Rhaenyra chose to have bastard children with Harwin, Alicent and Otto chose to crown Aegon. Back at the Great Council, it was the Lord's choice to crown Viserys instead of Rhaenys. And before that, it was the random, accidental deaths of Prince Aemon and Balon that created the whole succession crisis in the first place. The characters' choices and random chance put Rhaenyra's family in power. Yet she thinks it's destiny, part of Aegon the Conqueror's dream, and that belief could be dangerous. Viserys once believed that his son with Emma was destined to be king, and that led to the tragic deaths of Emma and their baby. There are similar stories with Rhaegar and Daemon Blackfyre II and Daenerys in Game of Thrones. These characters blindly follow their dreams, believing they cannot fail, but this ends up destroying them and the people they love. Rhaenyra's belief in destiny could lead to tragedy. We see Rhaenyra's love for Luke, which gives his later death more impact. The warmth Rhaenyra shares with her children contrasts with Alicent's difficult and distant relationships with her children. Rhaenys arrives on Dragonstone. Last episode, Rhaenys escaped Aegon's coronation. So now she tells Rhaenyra and Daemon that Viserys is dead, and Aegon has been crowned. Daemon's reaction to his brother's death is to reach for his sword and say that Alicent must have murdered Viserys, which is a wild allegation. Daemon saw that Viserys was on his deathbed. He was literally falling apart for years. But Daemon wants someone to blame. He needs an enemy to fight. Because violence is the only way Daemon knows how to deal with his feelings. Like in episode 3, when he feels insecure so he beats up that messenger, and goes on a suicide mission against the crab feeder. With Viserys dead, Daemon again channels his emotions into violence, and prepares for war against the Greens. Rhaenyra is also shocked. Just days ago, she seemed to reconcile with Alicent. Alicent said that Rhaenyra would be queen, but now Alicent betrays her by crowning Aegon instead? It's like when Alicent suddenly married Viserys. Rhaenyra feels hurt by her friend all over again. Rhaenyra is so upset that she goes into labour. She starts to give birth, even though it's too early. The baby is premature. So at this crucial moment, when Rhaenyra's claim to the throne hangs in the balance, Rhaenyra can't participate in the politics because she's busy giving birth. Rhaenyra's mother told her that the childbed is the woman's battlefield. Men make war, and ladies make babies, and Rhaenyra always hated that. She was frustrated being excluded from politics for being female, and she never wanted to give birth. She saw childbirth kill her mother. 
So in this childbirth, Rhaenyra is afraid and angry. The director says Rhaenyra is at war with her own body. In the books, Rhaenyra is even more angry here. Rhaenyra's labour lasts for three days, and the whole time she screams curses against Aegon, Aemond, and Alicent, detailing the torments that she would inflict upon them before she would let them die. Rhaenyra curses the baby inside her, clawing at her own belly, shouting for it to get out. When the baby is born, it's dead and deformed. In these photos from a prosthetics designer, the baby has scaly skin. It looks kind of like grayscale, that skin disease that the crab feeder had. Grayscale can be contagious, and Daemon got covered in the crab feeder's blood, so you could speculate that Daemon and Rhaenyra's baby was infected with grayscale. But that's probably not what happened here. Because in the books, the baby is described as twisted and malformed with a stubby, scaled tail. And this sort of thing has happened to Targaryens before. One of King Maegor's wives birthed a malformed baby with wings. Daenerys gives birth to a stillborn that is scaled like a lizard with a stubby tail and leather wings. So why do Targaryens keep giving birth to deformed, dragon-like babies? Targaryens say that they are the blood of the dragon. Their Valyrian ancestors claimed that they were literally related to dragons. These murals in Hot D show dragons having sex with humans. The books say that Valyrians did blood magic experiments, breeding humans with monsters to create hybrid creatures. So it sounds like Targaryens are literally part dragon, created by Valyrian magic as a way to control dragons. Occasionally birthing dragon-like babies could be a side effect of their dragon DNA. We see shots of Rhaenyra's dragon while she gives birth, emphasising this dragon connection. Symbolically, dragons represent death and destruction. They are the opposite of childbirth and new life. The books say that dragons plant no trees. So it makes sense that the Targaryens with their dragon blood sometimes fail to make new life through childbirth. Targaryens are destructive, so can Rhaenyra and Daemon build a peaceful kingdom, or can they only make fire and blood? In the books, Rhaenyra names this baby Visenya, after Queen Visenya, the sister wife of Aegon the Conqueror. Visenya used the sword Dark Sister, which is now used by Daemon, and Visenya rode the dragon Vega, who is now ridden by Aemond. In Hot D, Rhaenyra wanted to have a sister named Visenya, so now she gives that name to her only daughter, who never gets to live. In the book, Rhaenyra blames the Greens for the death of Visenya. She says, They stole my crown and murdered my daughter, and they shall answer for it. As she gives birth, Rhaenyra screams Daemon's name. But instead of supporting his wife, Daemon gathers their allies for war. They've only got a few hundred soldiers on Dragonstone, but some minor lords from nearby come to help, including Lord Simon Staunton and Lord Bartimus Keltegar. It's funny to see Lord Keltegar, because the Keltegars are Valyrian. Like the Targaryens and Valerions, the Keltegars originally came from the ancient Valyrian Dragonlord Empire, and survived the fall of Valyria by coming to Westeros before the Doom. So the Keltegars have Valyrian silver blonde hair, and they have some cool treasures, like a Valyrian steel axe, and a horn that can supposedly summon monsters from the deep. But the Keltegars aren't a powerful house. They don't have dragons like the Targaryens do. They don't have ships and money like the Valarions. So the Keltegars are often ignored. Throughout this season, Viserys and Corlys keep saying that the Targaryens and Valarions are the two great Valyrian houses, the last pillars of old Valyria. They keep excluding the Keltegars, which was a running joke in the Hot D writing room. Rhaenyra doesn't want Daemon to start a war while she's busy giving birth. So instead, Daemon confronts the Kingsguard. The Kingsguard are meant to be seven noble warriors sworn to defend the king. But the Kingsguard is now divided between supporting Rhaenyra or Aegon. 
Laurent Marbrand and Stefan Darklin are with Rhaenyra. Kristen Cole and Arik Cargill are with Aegon. Eric Cargill left Aegon and is coming to help Rhaenyra. Harold Westerling left Aegon and is now missing. And there's also a seventh Kingsguard who we haven't seen yet. With all this defection and betrayal going on, Daemon is suspicious of Laurent and Stefan. So to keep them loyal, Daemon threatens them with his dragon and says if they betray Rhaenyra, they will die screaming. The Game of Thrones books often ask if rulers should win their people's loyalty through fear or through love. The Lannisters often use fear, threats and intimidation, while the Starks cultivate love through honour, respect and good governance. Daemon is more on the side of fear. He terrorises common folk with his gold cloaks. He tells Rhaenyra that your subjects must fear you. And he tells Jace that these threats to the Kingsguard are the true meaning of loyalty. Otto did a similar thing last episode, forcing lords to swear loyalty and hanging Lord Caswell to scare people into compliance. So people on both sides of this conflict use fear to rule. Jace watches closely as his stepdad Daemon threatens the Kingsguard. Now that Harwin and Laenor are gone, Daemon is the closest thing Jace has to a father. And as fathers go, Daemon is not great. Earlier we see Jace pushing Luke around in training. Is Daemon a bad influence on Jace, teaching him to be more violent? Jace is Rhaenyra's firstborn son, her heir to the throne. So what kind of man is Jace becoming? Rhaenyra and Daemon cremate their baby. It's a similar moment to Emma and Balon's cremation in episode one. And there's a sense of distance between Daemon and Rhaenyra. We see the two grieving separately, not together. They don't always share their feelings and vulnerability with each other. Eric Cargill arrives, because last episode Eric left Aegon to join Rhaenyra. And on his way out, Eric took Viserys' crown. So while Aegon has the crown of Aegon the Conqueror, Rhaenyra has her father's crown, which is an important symbol, perhaps suggesting that Rhaenyra is Viserys' true heir. This crown was also worn by the old king Jaehaerys, the conciliator who brought peace to the realm. Can Rhaenyra continue that legacy? Daemon crowns Rhaenyra, just as he crowned Viserys earlier, and this funeral becomes a coronation from grief to a new beginning. The scene is very different to Aegon's coronation, which was a big planned event of political theatre that was preceded by secrecy and infighting. While Rhaenyra's coronation is spontaneous and honest and heartfelt, Rhaenyra once asked if the realm would accept her as queen, so it's emotional when all these people kneel to Queen Rhaenyra. A showrunner says that in this moment Rhaenyra becomes her father, because she wears her father's crown and she loses a baby, just like Viserys lost baby Balon and lost Emma. Viserys was never the same after Emma died. Will Rhaenyra's reign also be defined by loss? Queen Rhaenyra holds her first council at the Painted Table. This is the table where Aegon the Conqueror planned his conquest, and where Stannis and Daenerys plan their attacks. The table is now lit up from within, like a RGB gamer keyboard. The pieces are set to play the Game of Thrones. In the books, this meeting is called the Black Council, because Rhaenyra's side is called the Blacks, and Aegon's side is called the Greens. The title of this episode is The Black Queen, which evokes chess, which is another Game of Thrones. Most of this show so far happened in the Red Keep in King's Landing. It was focused on one family in one place. But this map table reminds us that there's a whole world out there. And now that the throne is at stake, the whole realm is in play, from Winterfell to Dawn. So the Blacks figure out who are their allies and who are their enemies. They already have the support of houses Keltegar, Staunton, Darklin, Massey and Bar Emmon. But those are all minor houses in the Crownlands, the area around King's Landing. They'll also need help from more powerful houses, like the Starks, Tullys and Arryns. 
The Starks of Winterfell rule the North, like Ned Stark in Game of Thrones. In Hot D Episode 1, Lord Rickon Stark swore to support Rhaenyra. Rickon is dead now, and the new lord is his son, Cregan Stark. The blacks figure that the Starks are honourable, so Cregan will keep Rickon's oath and will support Rhaenyra. Though in the books, they say that the North is so far away from the rest of Westeros that by the time a Northern army marches south, the war might be over already. The Vale is ruled by House Arryn of the Eyrie, like Lysa Arryn in Thrones. The current ruler is Jane Arryn, and Rhaenyra says that Jane will support her because Rhaenyra's mother was an Arryn, a cousin of Lady Jane. Though previously, Daemon said that he would ask Lady Jane to give him the castle of Runestone, and that didn't work out. In the books, Jane warns Daemon that he's not welcome in the Vale. So will Jane support the Blacks? The Riverlands are ruled by the Tullys of Riverrun, like Edmure Tully in Thrones. The current lord is Grover Tully, but Grover is old, and we heard previously that Grover's son mostly rules for him. And Rhaenyra says that Grover is fickle, so she plans to send Daemon on his dragon to convince the Tullys to support them. The Riverlands are in the centre of Westeros, near King's Landing, so the region is strategically important. Daemon suggests that they take the castle of Harrenhal as a place to gather their forces. The Stormlands are ruled by the Baratheons of Storm's End, like Renly Baratheon in Thrones. In episode 1, Lord Boromund Baratheon swore to support Rhaenyra, and Boromund was friendly with his cousin, Rhaenys. But Boromund has now died, and his son Boros rules the Stormlands. The Blacks hope that Boros will stay loyal like his father. Dawn is ruled by Prince Corin Martell. At this time, Dawn is not a part of Westeros, they don't recognise the authority of the Iron Throne, and Dawn has occasionally gone to war against the Targaryens, so the Martells are not a likely ally for Rhaenyra or Aegon. The Reach is ruled by the Tyrells of Highgarden, like Mace Tyrell and Elena in Game of Thrones. Currently, the Lord of Highgarden is a baby named Lionel, with his mother acting as regent. In the books, the Blacks expect the Tyrells to support Aegon and the Hightowers, Technically, the Tyrells rule over the Hightowers, but in many ways the Hightowers are more powerful than their Tyrell overlords, because the Hightowers rule Old Town, the biggest city in Westeros, and they're closely tied with the Faith of the Seven and the Maesters of the Citadel. Lord Hobart Hightower and his brother Otto are the main supporters of Aegon's claim, so the Tyrells and the Reach may follow their lead. The Westerlands are ruled by the Lannisters of Casterly Rock, like Tywin Lannister in Thrones. The Lord of Casterly Rock is now Jason Lannister, and he will probably support Aegon. Because Jason's twin brother Tyland is on Aegon's small council. Jason is probably still butthurt that Rhaenyra rejected his marriage proposal, and we've seen Jason close with the Hightowers. The Lannisters are rich and powerful, they command the Westerlands, and they have ships, so they'll be an important ally for the Greens. The Iron Islands are ruled by House Greyjoy of Pike, like Balon Greyjoy in Thrones. The Lord of Pike is currently Dalton Greyjoy, called the Red Kraken for all the blood he spilled in battle. Dalton is only 16 years old, and he's already sailed and raided around the world. Dalton has a Valyrian steel sword called Nightfall, and it's said he loves three things, the sea, his sword, and women. The Greyjoys are important because they have a powerful fleet that could rival the Valerions, but the Ironborn don't have the best reputation for being reliable allies, so will they support Rhaenyra or Aegon? Another important house is House Valerion of Driftmark, led by Lord Corlys. Technically, the Valerions are a minor house of the Crownlands, sworn to House Targaryen. But in practice, the Valerions are one of the most powerful houses, with the biggest fleet and the most money. So Rhaenyra hopes for their support. So the Blacks are outnumbered. Aegon and the Hightowers have more soldiers than Rhaenyra does. Aegon has the capital city of King's Landing, he has the throne, he has the Conqueror's crown and the Conqueror's sword and the Conqueror's name. He was anointed by a septon in front of tens of thousands of people, and many lords will prefer Aegon because he's male. 
Rhaenyra had once been popular. She was called the Realm's Delight. But the books say that Rhaenyra's body is now aged and thickened, so she might not be as popular anymore. Many lords swore oaths to support Rhaenyra, but that was 24 years ago, and many of those lords are now dead. So will Rhaenyra get the allies she needs to defeat the Greens? Lord Keltegar says it doesn't matter who supports them, because Rhaenyra has lots of dragons, the most powerful weapons of war in this world. Rhaenyra rides the dragon Cyrax, Daemon has Caraxes, Rhaenys has Melis, Baylor has Moondancer, Jace has Vermax, Luke has Arax, Joffrey has Tyraxes. Rhaenyra and Daemon's son Aegon has a dragon called Stormcloud, though Aegon is too young to fly. So the Blacks have seven dragon riders, while the Greens only have four. Aegon rides Sunfire, Aemond rides Vega, Helena rides Dreamfire, and there is a fourth child of Alicent and Viserys named Daeron. Daeron is currently chilling in Old Town with the Hightowers, but Daeron has a dragon named Tessarion, the Blue Queen. Aegon and Helena's children, Jehera and Jeheris, have young dragons called Morgul and Shrykos, but they're too young for war. So the Blacks have more dragon riders than the Greens do. And the Blacks have some unclaimed dragons who don't yet have riders. Sea Smoke was the dragon of Laenor and is now on Driftmark. Vermithor and Silverwing were the dragons of the old King Jeheris and Queen Alysanne. And there are the Wild Dragons, Sheepstealer, Grey Ghost, and the Cannibal. Sheepstealer is an ugly brown dragon who eats sheep from shepherd's flocks, along with the occasional sheepdog. Grey Ghost is shy and elusive, eating fish snatched from the sea. And the Cannibal is a big old dragon notorious for eating other dragons, even raiding hatcheries to eat dragon hatchlings and eggs. Some say that the Cannibal was on Dragonstone before the Targaryens arrived. If the Blacks can find riders for these unclaimed dragons, they could outnumber the Greens dragon riders 13 to 4. And sure, the Greens will still have a bigger army, but the history of Aegon's conquest shows that almost always dragons beat armies. However, dragons can kill dragons. Like King Maegor the Cruel once used his dragon Beleriand to kill his nephew Aegon and his dragon Quicksilver. And the Greens do have Vega, the most powerful, dangerous dragon alive. So if Rhaenyra sends her dragon riders against Aegon's dragon riders, she'd have to risk the lives of her family. Rhaenyra hopes to find a peaceful solution instead. Otto arrives with a message from Alicent and Aegon, and he uses a banner with a green dragon. The Targaryen sigil is usually a red dragon, but if Rhaenyra and Aegon used the same colour heraldry, this conflict could be very confusing. So to tell the sides apart, in the books, Rhaenyra uses a Targaryen dragon courted with her mother's Aran sigil and with a Valerion's seahorse, while Aegon uses a golden dragon because his dragon Sunfire is coloured golden. He also used a golden dragon at his coronation last episode. Although now Otto is using a green dragon, so maybe the greens are still figuring out their new logo. But Otto meets Daemon on the Dragonstone Bridge, and Rhaenyra arrives on Cyrax, just like the scene in episode 2. Back then, Daemon was rebelling, and Rhaenyra made him back down. But this time, Rhaenyra and Daemon are united. It seems like a bad idea to send Otto on this diplomatic mission, since Rhaenyra and Daemon hate Otto, they've been political rivals for years. Just last episode, Otto wanted to murder Rhaenyra until Alicent forced him to offer peace instead. So why does Alicent trust Otto with this peace mission? Maybe Alicent should have come herself. In the books, it's Grand Maester Orwile who brings this peace offer. Rhaenyra says Orwile is wrong to support Aegon, so she rips off his maester's chain and gives the chain to her maester Gerardus, declaring Gerardus to be the real Grand Maester. Mushroom claims that Orwile is so scared by this that he pisses himself. But Otto gives his peace terms. He says that if Rhaenyra gives up her crown and lets Aegon be king, then they'll let Rhaenyra live as the ruler of Dragonstone, and Luke can inherit Driftmark. 
Her younger sons, Aegon and Viserys, will go to live in King's Landing. And what this really means is that the kids will be hostages. Like, if Rhaenyra rebels, Aegon and Viserys could be killed. It's like how Theon was taken to live with the Starks after the Greyjoy Rebellion. Otto says Rhaenyra can't win. He urges Rhaenyra to make peace, and he gives Rhaenyra a page from a book. In episode one, Rhaenyra gave this page to Alicent. It's a symbol of their friendship, of the hope that they might reconcile. But this page could also have other meanings, because the page describes Nymeria, an ancient eastern princess. Rhaenyra once listened to a song about how Nymeria sailed away to escape her enemies. Like how Kristen Cole said that he and Rhaenyra should flee to the east, and like Alicent suggested last episode that Rhaenyra should leave Westeros. So maybe running away is an option. On the other hand, Nymeria is a symbol of female power and defiance. Nymeria became a ruler in Dawn. So the page highlights Rhaenyra's difficult choices here. Should she run away? Should she stay and fight? Or should she try to compromise? Rhaenyra's actor says that, on some level, Rhaenyra wants validation from Otto. Rhaenyra has just lost her father, and so she seeks approval from Otto as a male authority figure. Part of her is tempted to submit and seek acceptance from Otto and Alicent. So Rhaenyra has a lot of complex emotions here. Meanwhile, Daemon threatens to cut off Otto's dick. Daemon is not the best diplomat, but Rhaenyra keeps the peace and considers Otto's offer. The meeting also brings together the two Kingsguard, Eric and Arik, after Eric abandoned Arik and joined Rhaenyra. These twin brothers are now on opposite sides of this conflict. In the books, there's a sad song written about this meeting called Farewell My Brother. Supposedly, Eric and Arik tried to convince each other to change sides, and when that failed, they made declarations of love and parted, knowing that next time they meet, they would be enemies. Daemon and the Lords are keen to attack the Greens with dragons, but Rhaenyra knows that when dragons go to war, everything burns, and there's collateral damage, like all those innocent people Rhaenys killed with her dragon. Dragons are weapons of indiscriminate mass destruction, and if Rhaenyra uses them against King's Landing, many innocent people could die. Rhaenyra doesn't want to rule a kingdom of ash and bone. Daenerys faces this same problem in Game of Thrones, and ultimately she decides to just burn King's Landing anyway. Will Rhaenyra find a better solution and succeed where Daenerys fails? Daemon loudly questions Rhaenyra, undermining her authority in front of their allies. So privately, Rhaenyra tells Daemon that they have a higher purpose. Viserys told Rhaenyra about Aegon the Conqueror's dream. The prophecy that the Targaryens must unite Westeros to defeat the White Walkers. But to Rhaenyra's surprise, Daemon doesn't know this prophecy. The secret is passed down from king to heir, and Viserys never considered Daemon his heir. He never fully trusted him. Daemon often felt rejected by Viserys, so it hurts him deeply to find out about this secret, about another way that Viserys chose Rhaenyra and not him. Rhaenyra's actor says that Daemon gets shafted from beyond the grave by the person he most loves. So once again, Daemon expresses his emotions with violence, and Daemon chokes Rhaenyra. Rhaenyra's actor suggests that Daemon has never been violent to Rhaenyra before. Maybe Rhaenyra thought Daemon would never hurt her, because she's his love, the mother of his children. But no, Daemon is dangerous even to his own wife. He killed his previous wife with a rock, after all. So is Rhaenyra safe with her husband? What might Daemon do next time he's emotional? For the last six years, Corlys Velaryon was fighting on the Stepstones. He got wounded in a battle, and it looked like he might die, which sparked that whole succession crisis when his brother Vaemond tried to claim Driftmark. But now Corlys has survived and returned to his wife Rhaenys. Rhaenys accuses Corlys of abandoning her. They had just lost both of their children, Lena and Lenor. Rhaenys needed her husband's support, but he left her for his war. Rhaenys tells Corlys that Vaemond was killed for his power grab, 
And Collis says that the Valerians have a problem with reckless ambition. Like, Corliss's endless ambition led him to travel the world and make his family rich, but he went too far in his attempts to get his family on the Iron Throne. He pushed for Rhaenys to be queen, he tried to marry his daughter Lena to King Viserys, he married his son Laenor to Princess Rhaenyra, and because of these ambitions, Corliss's family was destroyed. Lena is dead, Laenor is seemingly dead, Vaemond is dead, and Corlys himself nearly died. So Corlys says that Rhaenys was right all along. His endless ambition is destructive. He says he'll give it up, and retire to Driftmark to be with Rhaenys and his granddaughters Baylor and Rhaena. But Rhaenys says it's too late for that now. Their supposed grandsons, Jace, Luke, and Joff, are in line to the throne. Luke is heir to Driftmark, and Baylor and Rhaena are betrothed to marry Jace and Luke. The Valerions are tied to Rhaenyra now, so as long as Aegon has the throne, their family is in danger. Throughout this episode, Rhaenys watches Rhaenyra, judges her. She sees that Rhaenyra truly wants peace and unity. She believes that Rhaenyra didn't kill Laenor, so Rhaenys says they should support Rhaenyra. And this time, Corlys listens. He announces that the Valerions will fully support Rhaenyra. In the books, Corlys is in his 70s, and he's weakened by his fever. He says he's clinging to life like a drowning sailor clinging to wreckage, but mayhaps the gods have preserved him for one last fight. With the Valerion's wealth and ships, they'll be a powerful ally for Rhaenyra. And Corlys reveals that he now has control of the Stepstones and the Narrow Sea. Last time he and Daemon took over the Stepstones, they didn't fortify or defend them afterwards, so the Triarchy just took them back. But this time, Corlys left a garrison to hold the Stepstones. Rhaenyra suggested doing that in a previous episode. So now the Valerions will blockade the Gullet, which is the ocean between King's Landing and the Narrow Sea. By controlling the traffic of ships there, they can prevent the Greens from getting supplies by sea. So Rhaenyra plans to surround King's Landing with soldiers and ships to force Aegon to surrender. But they don't yet have enough men, so Rhaenyra wants help from the Starks, Arons, and Baratheons. The quickest way to convince these houses to join her is with dragons. So Rhaenyra sends her sons, Jace and Luke, as messengers on Dragonback. This shot of the kids above the painted table shows us that Jace and Luke and Bela and Rhaena are no longer just children. They are military assets, pieces in the Game of Thrones. In the books, the younger son, Joffrey, wants to go too, but Rhaenyra doesn't let him because he's just 11. The boys are keen to show off their dragon riding to prove that they are not just strong bastards. They are true Targaryens, because only Targaryens can ride dragons. Corlys corrects the boys and tells them they are Valarions, but he says this with pride in his voice. The plan is that Jace will fly to the Vale to talk with Lady Jane Arryn. Then he'll go to Winterfell to talk with Lord Cregan Stark. Cregan is young, 21 in the books, so Rhaenyra hopes that Jace will make friends with this important ally. Meanwhile, Luke, the younger son, will have the quicker, easier task to fly to Storm's End to talk with Lord Boros Baratheon. All of these families once swore loyalty to Rhaenyra. Arryn and Baratheon are related to Rhaenyra, and dragons are very convincing. In the books, King Jaehaerys believed that dragons are best used as an unspoken threat. A dragon is a reminder of all the battles where armies have been roasted in dragon flame, so just showing a dragon to a lord can convince them to stay loyal, like a kind of nuclear deterrence. So Rhaenyra hopes that her sons and their dragons will quickly convince the North Vale and Stormlands to support her. She doesn't want Jace and Luke to get in any fights, this is a strictly diplomatic mission. So she makes them swear on the Seven-Pointed Star, the holy book of the Faith of the Seven. Rhaenyra doesn't believe in the Seven. The Targaryens are from Valyria, not Westeros, and Targaryens tend to see themselves as gods. But King Aegon Targaryen the Conqueror realised that to rule Westeros, the Targaryens need to respect Westerosi culture and religion. Daenerys learns something similar when she tries to rule Marine. 
She's told that if you want to be king of the rabbits, you've got to wear some floppy ears. So Daenerys wears traditional Miranese clothing when in Marine. So telling Jace and Luke to respect the Seven Gods is a good political lesson from Rhaenyra. Though she makes a mistake sending her children on this mission. Jace and Luke are teenagers with little experience in politics. They have a history of getting involved in impulsive fights. Jace and Luke are Rhaenyra's heirs, making them potentially valuable hostages if captured. And their young dragons are not as impressive as fully grown dragons. It might have been smarter to send Rhaenys on Melis or Daemon on Caraxes for these missions. But Rhaenyra farewells her sons and sees Luke for the last time. Daemon visits a dragon. This is Vermithor, the Bronze Fury, who was once the dragon of the old king Jaehaerys. Vermithor and Jaehaerys flew all over Westeros on royal tours alongside Queen Alysanne on Silverwing. Vermithor fought in Dornish Wars, burning a Martell fleet. Then Jaehaerys died, and for 30 years now, Vermithor hasn't had a rider. Vermithor is the second oldest and probably second biggest dragon alive after Vhagar. So he could be the most powerful weapon Rhaenyra has, if someone can claim Vermithor and ride him. Only people with Targaryen blood can ride dragons, and a Targaryen can only ride one dragon. Rhaena Targaryen doesn't have a dragon yet, so maybe she will claim Vermithor. Daemon sings a Valyrian lullaby to soothe Vermithor, but he still appears wild and ferocious. This is the dangerous power that war could unleash, and Daemon is eager to use it. Luke and Arax arrive at Storm's End, the Baratheon castle. This is one of the strongest castles in Westeros, with massive walls and a colossal tower that looks like a fist raised to the sky. The castle was supposedly built by Duran Godsgrief in defiance of the Storm Gods. Melisandre says there are protective spells woven into its stones. Luke discovers that the Greens got here first. To treat with Lord Boros, they sent Amond, the guy whose eye Luke cut out years ago, and Boros is siding with Amond. Rhaenyra had assumed that Boros would be like his father Boromond. The book says Boromond was stone, strong and unmoving. But Boros is like the wind that rages and howls and changes. Boros doesn't keep his father's oath to support Rhaenyra. He doesn't care that Rhaenys is his distant cousin. He feels that Rhaenyra has taken him for granted, and he would prefer the male ruler, Aegon, to the female ruler, Rhaenyra. So Boros accepts Aemon's offer of a marriage pact. Aemon will marry one of Boros's daughters in return for an alliance. It's like when Robb Stark was going to marry a Frey in Game of Thrones. In the books, Mushroom claims that Amond kisses each of the Baratheon women before he chooses one to marry. Boros asks if Luke can also offer a marriage alliance, but Luke is not free to marry because he is betrothed to Rhaena. So Boros rejects Luke and Rhaenyra and sides with the Greens. We see that Boros can't read, so he gets his maester to read Rhaenyra's letter for him. It's pretty common in Westeros for lords to be illiterate and to rely on maesters. And there are hints in the books that maesters sometimes twist the words of letters, manipulating lords for their own goals. Amond takes off his eye patch to show the sapphire that he wears in his empty eye socket. Amond wants payback for when Luke cut out his eye, so he demands that Luke cut out one of his own eyes to pay this debt. Boros prevents them from fighting because he doesn't want princes mutilating each other in his living room, and Amond does a little twirl sheathing his knife, just like the little twirl he did years earlier. So Luke tries to get out of dodge while he's still got his eyeballs, but Amond and Vhagar chase after him. And in the books, there's a little more to this. Because at first, Amond doesn't chase Luke, but then one of Boros's daughters, Maris, speaks up. Maris is angry that Amond didn't choose her to marry, so Maris says, was it one of your eyes Luke took, or one of your balls? 
She taunts Amon, makes him angry, and it's because of that that Amon decides to chase after Luke. Amon and Vagar swoop and snap at Luke and Arax. Amon doesn't intend to kill Luke, he just wants to scare him. He enjoys terrorising the kid who took his eye. But things get out of control. Arax spits flame in Vagar's face, even though Luke didn't tell Arax to do that. Then Vagar chases them down and kills Luke and Arax, even though Amon didn't tell Vagar to do that. The dragons disobey their riders, and now Rhaenyra's son, Prince Luke, is dead. We saw in the Dragon Pit that controlling a dragon is a skill and a bond that develops over time. We saw Vagar resist Lena's command to burn her. Dragons have a will of their own. In the books, Daenerys struggles to control her dragon, Drogon. She thinks that the ancient Valyrians used magic spells and horns to control dragons, but the Targaryens don't have those tools. In episode 1, Viserys said the idea that we control the dragons is an illusion. Because dragons are fire. Dragons are magic. And the books say that magic can't be controlled, it's a sword without a hilt. Viserys warned that dragons could destroy the Targaryens, just as the Valyrians were doomed. It's hinted that dragons can feel the emotions of their riders. And in this moment, Luke and Aemond are full of emotion, of adrenaline and fear. So it's no surprise that the dragons felt that and lashed out with violence. Or maybe the dragons acted out of their own desires. Vagar is a 180 year old battle hardened nuclear dinosaur. Maybe she doesn't care what the teenager on her back wants. Ultimately, it may have been a bad idea to give dragons to children in a political crisis. And with the death of Prince Luke, peace seems impossible. And what does this mean for Amond? Luke was Amond's nephew, and in Westeros, kinslaying, killing family, is a terrible crime. Will Amond admit that he killed Luke by accident, or will he accept the label of kinslayer? On Dragonstone, Rhaenyra finds out that her son has been killed. The actor says that Rhaenyra thought she knew grief. She had lost her mother Emma and her father Viserys. She lost her lover Harwin. She lost her baby Visenya. But now that she's lost her son Luke, she realises she knew nothing of how deep grief can be. This loss changes Rhaenyra. Will she still want peace, or will she want to punish the Greens for killing her son? The script says war is in her eyes. This look is similar to Daenerys' expression in Game of Thrones before she burns King's Landing. Will Rhaenyra do the same? Will she unleash her dragons and daemon against her enemies? Season 1 is kind of the prologue to the main conflict of House of the Dragon. Season 1 tells us the backstory, who these families are, what's their relationships and history. That's why it has all these time jumps and actor changes. It shows a storm brewing over generations. But season 2 will be different. Season 2 is when the storm breaks, and the dance of the dragons begins. If you want to know the full story of Hot D, you've got to check out the book Fire and Blood. There's also the main series of Game of Thrones books, and the world book, and Duncan Egg. You can get any one of these on audiobook for free right now at audible.com slash ASX. Sign up for a premium plus trial membership, and you get an audiobook to keep, even if you cancel the trial. You can get any Game of Thrones book, or Lord of the Rings, or Dune. Membership also includes unlimited access to thousands of audiobooks and shows in the Audible Plus catalogue. Sign up at audible.com slash ASX or text ASX to 500 500. Thanks for watching, and thanks to the patrons, including Jade Harris Eva, Dammit Mike, Micah Joel Love, Alex Kaplan, Scott Tony, Ryzen Lane, and Carnage Trooper. Cheers. I'm not signing shit until I get an eye. You owe me. We're not giving you an eye! You realize how preposterous that is?